Salutations, everybody. It is Maddie here today with a very special conversation I've been itching to have for a while, and I could not do it on my own. I don't think I'm qualified for it. I got to bring in the number one reviewer in the building, Skill Up. How are you doing, my friend? Welcome aboard. Good. But don't, don't call me that, man. Come on now, please. That's that's not how we do the intro around here. Come oh, on, no. Man. That's, that's, not, that's not it. <laughs> you don't like that? You're not feeling it? Definitely do not like that. Definitely <laughs> don't like that. Not at all. So. All right. Well, you're here to talk reviews with me because we're in a time period where there's a lot of diversity of thoughts, right? We, we got sure. the, the journalists. We got us YouTubers. We got many thoughts. We got Twitter. Everyone's sharing their thoughts on games and reviews are at a point in time now where people are talking about the process of them, the scaling of them. And you know, very often we see the, well, you gave this an eight out of 10, but this got a seven out of 10. Why is that? And I thought now is a great time for that conversation when we're hot on the heels at the time of recording this with Elden Ring and just a lot of games coming out. Um, and before we really got into all that stuff, I wanted to rip through our personal process as reviewers and then sure. get into how we think the current battlefield of reviews is at this moment battlefield. the battlefield right <laughs> make it nice and, light, it. nice and toxic is it is it is it uh is it reviewers at war with each other yes. or at war with yes, gamers yeah. is that what it is <laughs> <laughs> right we hate each it's other a, that's right so i want to know for i've gone over mine a million times on my channel i still will but i just want to dish it to you real quick and, and know what do you do when you craft your reviews like the recording process scripting note sure. taking is that a part of it at all how do you do your reviews sure. Sure, sure. Well, first of all, can I just say thank you very much for having me? Oh, of and, course. Um, I've really, as I, I, as I said to you, I've been watching your stuff for a long time and I've always really loved your reviews. You. Uh, I think, you know, you're super thorough and professional and love your like personal takes on stuff. And um, yeah, whenever a game comes out, I'm always tuning in Bro, for the green I'm such a big fan of you man. that I was turning red in the intro. Like I can feel my <laughs> body temperature going you, up, bro. I'm you just like, do that thing with the with the saturation. You just turn that yeah, down. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna have no, Josh turn that down. That. He'll, he'll, he'll gray, grayscale you at this moment. You know. There we go. Um, no, but as I said, I do appreciate being here. So thanks very much. Of um, course. Yeah, in terms of in terms of my process, so um, like obviously it starts with the hustle and. Uh, I think that's kind of something we don't really talk about. The review scene doesn't talk about, well, it kind of does, but not really. Um, don't, you can't just assume you're gonna get a review code for anything, like mm -hmm. nothing. So, you know, even though you might have a good relationship with X publisher, uh, the review process for me still begins like three months earlier, being like, hey, I'm interested in reviewing that title, uh, just so you know. Like, mm -hmm. And then I will send that email again, like a month before, and then I will send it like a week before, being like, hey, just seeing if you've got timing on review code, and yep. uh, most of the time, you won't have had any response at all to the, any of those emails. Okay, so and I'm then not all the of a sudden, one. all right, good. <laughs> nah, dude, nah, dude, no, 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 because like obviously, like my channel is bigger, right? Sure, as in like you know, bigger than your average review channel, but like that does not mean that I, I get you know immediate access to all game codes. Sure. And certainly, I, I do get plenty. Don't get me wrong, but um, but if I'm ever complacent in regards to that. That I just they just won't arrive. You know what I mean? You fall off the mailing lists or whatever, how it all comes together, you just get left off. So step one is actually that hustle and making sure that you're in front of the people that distribute the codes so you can get them in time for the embargo, right? Of course. After that, um, when you get the code, it's like, fuck. How the hell am I going to finish this before the embargo, right? There's like this like <laughs> fear. You're like, this is impossible, you know, they give you like uh, what was it? The 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 Final Fantasy Strangers of Paradise they game. They gave or us like a weekend. They gave me like four days yeah. for a forty-hour game. You're like, <laughs> what am I supposed to do with this? You know. So then it's like, okay, well, what's my schedule? And I do think actually, certainly for an independent, scheduling matters a lot. I'm a little bit jealous of like publications because you know they share the workload amongst them. You know, and, and they get assigned a game to play. Versus for us, it's like we have everything. to play everything or as much as we can if mm -hmm. we want to stay relevant, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, trying to work the scheduling is like a really tough part of it. Um, and then obviously, yeah, you start playing it and it's just partitioning parts of your life and saying, okay, cool. A a again, part of that is talking to the people around me and being like, hey, wife, I'm going to be reviewing Elden Ring for the next forever. Sorry, you don't have a husband for the next like mm -hmm. s 80 hours slash eight <laughs> days or whatever it is, you know? Um, and so having that support network around is actually really helpful as well. Um, and then, yeah, you play it and uh, I record everything as I go. Uh, it's funny because I often hear 
publications talk about the fact that they need to play a game and then someone else does the capture for it. Like, yeah. I, I definitely hear that a lot. I'm like, what do you mean you're not recording when you're playing? That doesn't mm -hmm. make sense to me. You just hit the record button and then when something happens, you save the file and you label it to like number it. Okay. And yeah, then I have same. like- I, I always yeah. find that fascinating because I, yeah, yeah, for, like for me, I'm, I, I used to do huge two hour gameplay capture files on mm, Elgato, mm. and it would just be like two, I'd have to comb through it all to find what I was talking about. Sure. And then I'll talk to Carrick, and he was like, Why don't you just stop the recording and label things? And I was like, Yeah, that's yeah, that's probably the play <laughs> because there are certain things that happen that you make note of, and I want to include that in the review to like show people the thing exactly as it yes. happened. And you just can't yes. replicate that if it's not happening consistently. So I always mm. found it interesting that that outlets will typically have them capture gameplay after the game's been completed by the reviewer, yeah, yeah, yeah. That I just don't see how that clicks together but i do th well i think that's kind of makes sense because often i think from publications and not there's not any shade because they have their own process and it works but like i don't i do think that they'll often just show sort of more generic b-roll footage that doesn't necessarily directly connect to the points they're making you know yeah. but i do think um one thing that i'm really specific about um and you know was bef while i was editing my videos and now with my editor austin is that when i say something i want the on-screen action to generally reflect that point you know yeah. and so that um that numbering thing really matters you know when something happens stop the recording label the file give it a number i also have a note thing that i do in like OneNote, you know microsoft mm -hmm. OneNote, yeah, yeah. where i basically just be like you know clip 55 this showed me that actually elden ring is a good video game you know mm -hmm. what i mean like uh and then that's it so then by the end i'll have this this the, all these files and i'll have this you know big stack of notes and then i start sifting through it f for a script you know and um that's really the hard part i think uh, because you know, obviously, my the review my reviews take on average about thirty minutes. Um, that's usually about five to six thousand words. Um, it's hard to write five to six thousand words every week. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it is, um, and for it to be you know interesting and insightful, and you want it to have some humor in there and whatever. Mm -hmm. But just getting through the sheer word count every week is a challenge. Um, and I think you know while I'm trying to do that, I'm I'm really trying to communicate what what a game feels like i think and i know that it's like it's such a meme because everyone's like this game makes you feel like batman but i'm like well yeah that's kind of the whole thing right everyone roasts that line but it is sort of like the most important aspect of sure. any review i think like well i mean i don't know i just i i kind of feel like the features of a game are less interesting than how those features make you feel you know yeah. um or what they make you experience and I think I try and focus my reviews on that rather than lists of features. Um, I kind of more talk about, well, what do you experience when you engage that feature? Um, and yeah, so then I have a script. I record the audio badly, full of mistakes. And then I'm like, lol, here it is, editor. Good luck with <laughs> this fun, one. Yeah. <laughs> and then have fun. And then he gets sent. I, I also upload all my footage onto a central drive. He gets the uh, footage and the script. The script will sometimes have mentions in like, hey, use this clip, mm. um, sometimes not. Often he'll just rely on the clip's labels to be able to pull what he needs. Um, Austin's amazing like that. He just knows what needs I to go that, where. Yeah. And um, yeah, man, then the, the whole there's a proofreading process and uh, it gets rendered and then it gets uploaded and then I get roasted in the comment section. That's yeah, it. So, yeah, I'll do. I've been feeling know, that with Tiny this... Tina's Wonderlands. Man, it's been Yeah, it's been a yeah I saw you didn't enjoy that. I mean, like, I can understand how someone wouldn't love Tiny Tina's. Like, mm -hmm. I think that's a perfectly valid perspective. It's a weird game to get roasted on. Do you know yeah, what I mean? yeah. Like, I was, it's very I, fair to not love that had, game. When I, was, when I was making my review, you know, sometimes you're making it and you got that feeling, you're like, yeah. Yeah, people are gonna have a problem with this one. <laughs> like that's how I felt sure. about Deathloop to some extent. Like right when sure. I was, it was going live. I was like, yeah, you know what? There's something about this game I could see people really like. And then the tens comment, and I'm the only one going, yeah, I found this kind of underwhelming because yeah, I played Prey Moon pretty... Crash. Yeah, I think it was kind of like you and G Man were kind of the really only reviewers with Deathloop that were like, mm -hmm. eh, I don't know about this one. You know, mm -hmm. I think everyone else is really yeah. loving it. Um, yeah. So no, I, I ended up really agreeing with your perspective on that as well when I eventually played it. You know. Yeah, I, mean? I saw. So, I um, saw it was it was relief to some extent. Like, <laughs> <laughs> the skill of validation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, man. No. Your your process mirrors a, a lot of mine. I, I thought it was interesting. One thing that you mentioned was note taking because I, I I see sometimes. Uh, I don't want to turn it into just smack talking, but I see a lot of reviewers who mention that they don't take notes, and I've never understood that because I feel like that's so crucial to the process. Like we're all human. 
we're all gonna forget things and I'll be the first to admit that there are times I'm scripting reviews and doing what you mentioned like I'm I'm going through I'm looking at the gameplay files I'm like oh yeah like that's a pretty key component there I probably want to include that as a as a mention and uh, for me that's always been integral to the process but you mentioned a full script I usually go bullet points uh, because I try sure. to I'm always a and I always have been just a flow guy like I, yeah, I, yeah, I want to yeah. make my reviews present as a friend talking to a friend like here's how I would talk to my my neighbor about the game and yep. and so for me if I'm reading off a script uh, I feel like I can't convey that as much not that it's the wrong way to do it by the way but just no, totally. for me it's, it's the, the the presentation style I like but I will say that as I've gotten deeper into the review game more and more I found myself scripting a little bit harder at least in the introductory yeah. section to be like here's the yep too long didn't read setup yeah, for you totally. and then build off of that in a more natural way yeah i think that's so true i think i used to do more freestyle reviews back in the day and i don't do them anymore generally speaking mm -hmm. because i would say like offhand comments that i don't agree that weren't accurate and then i would get roasted for those and then i would get like oh why did i say that that's such a dumb thing to have said and so i really sure. agonize a lot more over my words now because Same. i know obviously more people watch my content and so the stakes are higher Same, yeah. and so i kind of feel like oh okay well I, I really better make sure i get this right i i know i produce better quality work when i write when i write a script yeah um but also i think that intro thing is so true like the hardest part of a review for me is my intro. I will agonize over that. That That is, I would say, it is like 40% of the overall workload of a script, um, that opening block. Because that's the part where you really come together, like bring together all your thoughts, and you really should communicate, like you said, that TLDR perspective. Um, I know a lot of reviews are like, is it any good? Let's find out. I'm like, mm. I'm like, I don't like that. I'm like, I'm like, well, everyone knows exactly what I think about a game at the end of the intro block. And I'm like, it's fine, but other people do that, by yeah, the way. Yeah. It's just like, for me personally, I really love my intro block to be this kind of holistic essay thesis, you know, mm -hmm. um, that really clearly communicates what I'm about to say. And then people can click off the video at that point if they like. They would have heard most of the... Um, the argument there but then it's just about filling out that argument throughout the rest of the script you know what i mean right on. so uh yeah I, I really spent a lot of time on that um i you know sometimes my editor i would be like okay austin today we're doing this video we're editing this video he's like okay and then i will start writing in the morning and then by like six o'clock at night i'm like okay i haven't finished the intro block yet we'll try again tomorrow <laughs> you know because i would have just spent the entire day going back and forth on the words for that so um important, yeah no I, I totally agree that that matters yeah yeah with that is big part of the review is the the verdict and and this is where i really wanted to bring the conversation together because i think the biggest point of discrepancy amongst any consumer of reviews is always the score the scaling you know we're most commonly the one that is attacked is the number scale right the one through ten sure. number scale the one through five number scale because you look at reviews parallel to it and go why is this that score but this one's below it and we do reviews differently on a scaling front. Like for me, I do a, since 2013, I think it was, I've done buy, rent or pass. You know, that's always been my thing, but game renting was a thing. Now it's like buy, buy on a sale, subscription services, game pass. Yeah. yeah, there's only so much I can yeah. fit into a title and SEO rankings sure. and all that stuff. So, you know, I gotta be honest with everyone. Like that's just how it's gotta sure. be. So uh, that's always been my thing is, I feel like when you start to slap number scores on, it doesn't tell people the true value. And I, cause you mentioned earlier, like you don't like to do a feature list. And I find it interesting because I like to do a feature list because I feel like oftentimes a lot of reviews will leave out important features in their sure. in their content and their approach that because it doesn't matter to them. And honestly, that makes sense. It's a reflection of yourself and what you like and didn't like and all that stuff. Yeah. But for me, I do a feature list because something may matter to someone else out there sure and sure. um so when i'm scaling all that out and i come to the end of the experience you know you, you roll the credits i'm like okay what if i put my 60 dollars down have i felt comfortable with that and one mm. of my parts of uh, uh my review process that i did take from carrick entirely which was um i'll put 60 dollars on the game no matter what like when they send me the free code i'll buy the game sure. regardless just so that you get a real tangible feeling of like did i feel kind of scammed here you know do i feel like I could have sure. gotten off with 40 bucks instead. How comfortable yeah, I feel yeah, about yeah. this? It, it, how comfortable would I felt with this game at what price point? Um, yep. Now for you with your scale, let's, uh, I won't want to speak for you. Let's get into that sure. and, and how you approach it versus how you feel about yeah. the, the number scaling. 
in the industry? Yeah, so um, yeah, I've definitely gone uh, in different places. Like I used to score reviews back in the day, um, mm. like a numbered score or whatever. Um, and I don't know. I don't even remember why I stopped doing that, to be honest with you. I just think my reviews kind of got longer and I was saying all this stuff and then I felt it was almost a bit reductive at the end to put a number on it. Not, And I don't, and just to be clear, like I actually like numbered reviews. Like I actually like the simplicity of a number because I think it really is the ultimate act of the, it's an act of the reviewer distilling the overall value of something to them mm-hmm. into the most basic metric, right? And so I'm, interested in that right i i am interested to hear what an ign score might be or game informer or whatever like that does it it is like cool all right well if you've gone to head like what do you really think about this out of 10 and i and i'm like okay cool that's that's great for me personally though i am less interested in that like i'm just I'm, i'm interested in providing my audience just a broader perspective on stuff but again, like if someone would say to me, hey man, you have to score your reviews from now on, I'd be like, okay, that's fine. You know what I mean? Like I would go along with it if I had to. Um, the scale that I use now is um, like the the recommend, don't recommend, whatever. Um, there's a few reasons for that. So yeah, so back you in changed the day, that from, I think it was last year you weren't doing that or late last year yeah, when yeah. you changed it. Yeah, because like basically I, as I was getting bigger, like I had a lot of, I wouldn't, okay, so clickbait is this, Thing, okay mm. obviously mm-hmm. and it's very powerful and i think it's very powerful as you are growing you know and on on this platform and it's almost it's necessary to grow on this platform i would say like it is it is the third rail so to speak and if you can really master clickbait a clickbait title it just it just gives your video so much more cut through right and so yeah. i was doing that a lot during my when i was coming up but eventually i and, and none, none of it was inaccurate none of it was lies or whatever it was just a really kind of like bold declarative statement to sum up what my review was about like you know assassin's creed is like bloated and endless you know what i mean like that is the kind of title that i would use um but as I got bigger and I just saw more and more people being like, I can't handle that dude's clickbait. It rubs me the wrong way. I think it clashes with his, uh, his approach. And I'm like, well, yeah, I kind of agree with that. You know, like how could I have these big reviews that are full of all this kind of like all this detail and whatever, but then I have these really reductive thumbnails that are just being like, this game boring, you know, like, Mm -hmm. and again, that's fine by the way. Like, I don't think those things are bad, Mm -hmm. but it's just for me personally, as I, you know, got bigger whatever so then i was like well what's anti-clickbait what's the least clickbait thing i could do i'm like i know i'll put the fucking conclusion to my video in the title like that's what i will do i will have nothing on the thumbnail just the word review and then i will have the thing in the title so you don't even need to click on the video okay and interestingly enough people still call that clickbait because they're like oh when you say you don't recommend something that's clear clickbait i'm like no it's not it's just me telling you what i think man that's not the definition of clickbait uh that's not how this works so um, yeah, so then, but but I think as well, like to your point about, um, you know, money, I, I, when I say I recommend, like I do talk about money a little bit, but uh, I, money, f- it, for me, time is a infinitely, is an infinitely more valuable currency than money, sure, sure. right? And so when I am talking about whether I recommend something, more often than not, I'm talking about whether it's worth your time, you know? Because if a publisher takes like 60 bucks from me, I'm like, oh, that's kind of annoying, it sucks. And obviously money's different for everyone, don't get me wrong, but like yeah. for me personally, I'm like, okay, you know, I can cop a 60 buck loss, that's okay. But if you rob like 68 hours from me, like fucking Valhalla did, then I'm like, okay, we have a problem here, you know what I mean? And that's when I get really pissed off. Because gotcha. I'm like, well, I could have done something so more, so much more interesting with that time. I could have played four other amazing indie games. I could have spent time with my family. I could have done so much, you know what I mean? So. yeah. yeah. Time is that time is that metric that I'm issuing my recommendations on yeah, and more, it, more than anything else. It really tailors into the the maturation, I guess, of your of your channel, right? You mentioned a lot of things that changed as you grew and as you got bigger. And I feel like I'm in that period right now where sure. my channel is growing a little bit, but I'm not quite there yet where, yeah, I'm definitely bold and brash in my titles, right? Like <laughs> sure, I said sure, that sure. I was extremely disappointed with Tiny Tina's Wonderlands. Like, I'm just like, this was, I have that same mindset of like, this is my conclusion, but definitely the yep. opinion is there, right? It's not just like, yep. I recommend this, I, I, you know, it's so it's funny you mentioned that because like, I feel like I'm in that transition 
point sure. where I'm looking to that next step that you're yes. already at. And it's sure, it's just sure, interesting sure, sure. To, to hear your mindset on those types of things. And uh, it's funny you mentioned time as a currency because that's that's so true. It's something I, I consider when I'm making my videos because I make a shit ton of content. Like I make videos almost every day and then I have Retro Rebound where you're getting two videos a week there plus a podcast I'm on for like three hours a week. So Dude, like I'm lot. everywhere, it's a lot, right? So I'm <laughs> like, lot. if I'm putting this much out, you got to think about mm. the, the quality of that. So, you, you know, I, I consider yes. that as well when playing the game for sure. But oftentimes it's typically mentioned in a, in a shorter game, right? Like, oh, well, I would rather 10 high quality hours than 50 yes, boring yeah. hours, right? That's always the sure. the, the, the sure. breath it's brought up in. And I I've, I found that always kind of funny. But mm. with that, we, we talk about time, getting games done before the embargo. <laughs> let's, let's have the tough talk now, shall we? Dude, dude. <laughs> Do we feel like, that, like, that these companies yeah. are giving us enough time? Because I, I, I think I mean, we're not getting a lot. I really don't. I know, but like, here's the thing, right? If like Denis Villeneuve, the like, you know, June director Blade Runner, if he came out and he said, dude, it's so hard being a big director. I mean, I work so many hours. I'd be like, dude, I don't fucking care. You know what I mean? <laughs> like you have this gig, you're very lucky to have it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like you have signed up for this life and that's it. And like, uh, sure. so like, I don't know, like obviously, yes, the answer is we do not get enough hours. And I think if a whole bunch of game reviewers were to be at a bar, we'd all sit around being like, eh, the fucking embargo on that one, huh? <laughs> that was a killer. <laughs> we would do that, of course, because sure. it fucking sucks, right? Yeah. It is detrimental to health and lifestyle and whatever. And I get that and I would love to see a change. I really would. But at the same time, I almost, like, I understand how it sounds when we talk about that. It's like world's smallest violin, man. Hey, you oh, get to 100%. play video games. Yeah. You get to play video games yeah. for a living. And like, and that's true. Like I'd have, I think we're extraordinarily fortunate to live these rarefied existences where yeah. we are literally play, paid to play video games. That is not lost in me. And I think that that perspective ultimately just pushes that other, that other conversation to the side. You know what I mean? And like, yeah. again, there's no, yeah, sure. I, I, I totally agree. Like we talk about crunch in video game uh, developers. A crunch in the review space is absolutely a thing. Um, but will it ever become like a thing that consumers are talking about and advocating on our behalf? No, no that's no. not that's not going to no. happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I really feel like it just it's down to us to set our own. Like we don't have to hit embargo. Like you know, we, we, it's possible for us to do our stuff later. And certainly now that my channel is bigger. I do have that luxury of putting stuff up later and it still gets views and I'm fortunate in that regard. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think most most creators who hit that point have that luxury, you know? But certainly when you're on the up and coming and you're really grinding hard and you really are, are working the algorithm, being on embargo is a, a deal breaker. It's, it's, it, can, it can mean the difference between your channel growing and not, you know? Mm -hmm. So I remember that struggle. Um, I mean, I still put myself through that struggle today because I really care about hitting embargo. But, you know, the stakes were different back then where yeah. I really had to do it. It's competitive almost. Because, yeah, well, I mean, I think it's I think it's less about competitiveness. And that's one thing I would say about the review space. I don't believe that the review space is at all a competitive space. Like, I don't think it's zero sum. I think it is possible for more than one fantastic reviewer to exist. And, and I don't think you lose reviews to other people or, pl or publications, but I do think you lose to the algorithm if you are not in yes. that algorithm enough at the right time, you know? Yeah. So your real enemy here isn't, you know, you are not my enemy, Matty, yes. okay? We're friends. The algorithm, <laughs> the algorithm is, is is our mutual enemy, yes. you know what I mean? I should mean? have specified that's it. what I meant when I said competitiveness, but yes, very well Sure, worked. sure, sure. But uh, yeah, we fight the algorithm every day and, um, and it's just about like, you know, Staying, staying in, staying relevant, etc. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You, you put it so perfectly there about embargoes because we we do live very blessed lives, right? We're we're, we're able sure. to play these video games, and 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 not only that, but like if you don't do my review policy, you get to play them for free. I had a launch, like a dream come true growing up. I remember, you know, when I was in high school, it's all I wanted was just to review games. Like it, it didn't matter. It still doesn't really matter like the income. Like of course I need to live, but. Um, you know, it's it's like still this childlike fantasy that's that we're yeah, all yeah, yeah. living in. Um, totally. So yeah, it's one of those things you don't want to bitch up a storm about. But at the same time, I, I do think of the consumer where I want them to get the best take of a game, and it does tie yeah. into one of the topics we wanted to cover about beating a game, 
putting a score on it, how necessary that is. And for me, I've always made it like, I refuse to put a score on a game and call it or call it a review unless the, the credits have rolled. It's just kind of been sure. my thing. And I've kind of seemed to find a way now where I can do that, where I'll have like impressions on a game and then I call it like a final verdict when the game is done after launch. And that's been a way where like I did it with Elden Ring, I did it with Skyrim Anniversary Edition and like they've performed well where you mentioned like finding out how to get views after the embargo lifts where it's probably the best time to be there. Um, but yep. it's, it's difficult, right? It's difficult to figure that stuff out. You want to have yep. that game as a creator done by embargo to, to be there, to be competitive with the algorithm. But at the same sure. time, you don't want to rush your content and the game to not only give it a fair shake, make sure you're, you're paying attention to everything, but the production time that we don't consider, because I don't know about you, like sometimes I'm thinking about just beating the game first and then <laughs> the production yeah. almost comes second. You're like, okay, now I got to no, figure no, out how to make this in, in like, 12 hours here we go definitely <laughs> it's, it's grind time so sure. a long-winded way of getting to the next topic of you know do you feel i know i watched your elden ring review and that was another sure. reason why i wanted to have you on to talk about the the need to beat a game before putting yeah. a score on it not to put your feet to the flame on it by the way just <laughs> no, no, more no, so no, to sure, pick sure. your mind on on that because i think we i think we share similar mindsets here but it, i know it's definitely a case-by-case -case basis so do you feel overall that you've got to have the experience complete to say like here's my verdict um, yes, in, in a broad sense, right? Um, so I finish almost everything that I review. And if I don't finish it, I always tell my audience that I have not finished it and explain mm. why that's the case. So like with Valhalla, I was like, listen, I'm 68 hours deep now. I've done everything I can do. I'm fucking stuck here. There's like, it wants me to do some bullshit I don't even know about. So I'm out, I'm done. Like 68 hours is enough. And I think as well with Elden Ring, that was a function of... You know, I didn't finish Elden Ring, but I had played more of Elden Ring on that playthrough than I had of any other Souls-like I'd ever played up to that point. Plus, I'd already seen what I thought was the bulk of that game. And there was obviously more after that, but the bulk of it. I knew what that experience was. And so in an ideal world, I would have loved to have finished Elden Ring and, sure. uh, um, you know, been able to do that. But at that point, I kind of made the judgment call where I'm like, okay, I have seen enough here to be really, really confident on what this is. And if the game falls in a heap at the end, okay, well, that could happen potentially, but I thought it would be very unlikely that the game would collapse in a heap sure. in that last little section. So I felt pretty comfortable putting out that review. But um, but I would actually say, in a like that's my approach to it, but I kind of feel like it, I don't think it's necessary to finish a game to review it. Mm -hmm. I'm really, I, I'm, how, what do I mean? Like, I'm really interested in the perspective of specific people, okay? And if you were to say to me, hey, I put 20 hours into Tiny Tina's, but I didn't finish it, here's my review, I'd be like, all right, I know Matty, I know what he's about, I, you know, I trust his perspective, he feels like he's played enough of it, and here's what he thinks. 20 hours is, I think, in general, more than enough time to review a game like Tiny Tina slash Borderlands. So I would think that is completely legitimate, right? But if you were to say to me, I'm reviewing, I don't know, Destiny 2 in 2022, and I've played 15 hours of it, here's what I think. I'm like, nah, man, that's not it. Like, that's stupid, Do you know what I mean? So case case. I think it, it it's case by case, but also it's about the people. Like if IGN were to come out and say, oh, we're reviewing, I don't know, like, I kind of expect IGN to finish their games. It's, it's I don't have that same personal connection to IGN. I, I look at them, they play a different role for me in terms of what I seek content from, you know what I mean? I, I am looking for more of that feature list from them, that high level view. Um, but from individuals that I connect with, content creators that I follow, um, I'm just looking for their take. And if they reach a point where they feel like they've played enough of a game to give me their take, their review, then I trust that, you know what I mean? Yeah. And if it was clear over time that that person continues to put out content that's not correct because they haven't played enough of a game, then obviously I would stop trusting their opinion and I wouldn't seek it out as much. But um, generally speaking, I trust reviewers to be able to judge when they've played enough of a game to review it, you know? Yeah. Um, that's where I go these days. Yeah, 100%. And I, I think that that's really well put because there are... It's because I think a lot of consumers just don't trust the general 
media and even a lot of content sure. creators nowadays just because of it, you know it bleeds in from other avenues right we saw what happened with philip Musin, and it's like well what about the reviews now like everything's in jeopardy sure. you look at the the prey situation with ign giving it a four and they're like well all their reviews are bad now right it's these kind of sure. mental leaps i look I at like, myself i like cyber i like cyberpunk therefore everything skill up says is irrelevant yeah. oh, dude, you I hear know that, I mean? right yeah for me it's fallout 4 <laughs> i i loved fallout 4 i was 18 sure. when i made the review it was, a, it was not my review i'm proud of but it, it's definitely sure, sure, followed sure. me for years to come where people totally. are still saying like you called totally. fallout 4 near perfect it's like right right when i was 18 right i'm sure. 26 now like it's been it's been sure. a while so let's <laughs> let's turn the chapter right but sure. uh yeah man it, it's it's just interesting to see where everyone is right now in this space and i i think i i should mention um because i didn't beat babylon's fall that was one i didn't beat and right. i did put a, a verdict on because i i do agree with the case by case approach because there are some yep. games for me it's like if it's good i feel you should see it through if it's really bad, I'm talking yeah, Godfall, yeah, yeah. Babylon's Fall, Crossfire Dungeons X. I, I did beat Crossfire X. Yeah, yeah, Dungeons <laughs> Dragons, like those types of ones where you're like, yeah, like in hour one, I know this is really bad. Like, how long yeah. do I want to agonize for? Yes. And yes. It, you just only get more worked up, especially if you're like me. Again, I try to do the natural approach. Like, I don't filter myself after a certain point with sure. the script. It's like, so I hit the ground running in some of these sure. these bad reviews or these games where I'm reviewing that they're really bad. Uh, but yeah, there are definitely times where I think the rules can bend and it's about knowing the creators at a certain point, right? And I think that's where the media stumbles a bit where you and I are a little more fortunate, like people can follow us and our mm -hmm. thoughts and kind of look through a, a catalog of videos and account for how we look at things and how sure. extensive we are. And it's right there where you don't know who's reviewing Tiny Tina versus Elden Ring over at IGN. Uh, uh, not that yeah. you can't find that out, but we're in a different era of media where I think like in 2012 2013 with like ign you know a lot of people were familiar with who was working there and i think now it's sort of fallen off in that regard still their mm -hmm. huge website very important outlet uh, as are many but i do think that uh there isn't that personal connection anymore yeah yeah no i totally yeah i mean i, I i've always thought it's interesting that like the likes of ign i don't know i i would be really interesting to see them kind of build their review outfit around because they don't have a review outfit everyone at ign kind of does reviews and also news and whatever but i don't know to put their people like to push them out a little bit more as personalities as people with expertise because there are certain people in ign that have expertise mm. in certain genres like luke riley does their um uh, racing stuff and um mitchell does like their most they're sort of like souls like and fighting games and whatever right so there are certain people that i've now come to know for their expertise but i think your average audience doesn't quite know that yeah, yeah. and then also there's just a whole bunch of other people that i don't know within that within ign but i don't know like I, that's a huge outfit with a lot of potential to really kind of silo its people based on their expertise and i think that might change how we view and it's not just ign by the way i shouldn't say that there's you know there's the all the big publications yeah, your game course. informers and your GameSpot and whatever else but i do think the review space is moving more towards like people and personalities and like well who do i align myself with you know yeah, like yeah. who do i who, who 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 has a perspective that i generally align with and i think that's why independent reviewers manage to do well you know that's why we are competitive on this platform versus other like you know ign has 20 million subscribers and gamespot has 5 million subscribers and whatever but we still manage to like eke out a living so to speak doing what we do because i think people really look for people with the same perspective as them so i think it, it would be really interesting to see those publications move more towards that model and build out the profile of their reviewers and, and and highlight their expertise so that people can then go okay cool this is luke riley from ign reviewing a racing game hell yeah let's go man this guy knows what he's talking about you know yeah I mean? so yeah that's what i've often thought about from when it comes to those those platforms those, those publications really the last thing i wanted to get into and you, you you kind of briefly touched on it there is kind of the aligning with viewpoints and um you know, again, I don't mean to keep reflecting back to it, but I look at what's happened with the Tiny Tina Wonderlands review, where it's not getting bombed by any means, but there's clearly like a strong, like, let me hit this like, let me tell this guy to go fuck himself, you know, a little, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And mm. uh, there's a, you know, have you ever, because I think I'd consider you extremely well-respected in, in the review space. Like, I think even if you come out with a, a scorching hot take, it's typically immediately <laughs> respected because like, you know what you're doing. Um, and if you wanted to, have you tracked that? Maybe I just noticed it from the outside looking in where like, you know, I, I think of like 
judgment right where i think that was the sure. game that you came out and were just like against the like grain this. yeah yeah <laughs> sure, 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 and sure, then sure. there were other ones that i feel like that that was a moment where i was like wow people are kind of pushing back on them there but sure. for the most part i see people are typically even if you're in the minority respecting that opinion and i, I want to know do you feel there's enough of that because it's something i still struggle with and i'm like how do you win that respect i just try to do my job be as honest transparent as possible just let it all go out there give as much information let them make the choice at the end give a price point um but there's uh, i almost feel there's too much ego attached to these games like you're attacking someone like in my case right. i was attacking borderlands fans by being like yeah sure. this game is just more of the same to me and yeah, some people yeah, take yeah, that yeah, personally right. how have you sure. felt you've circumnavigated that because i think that's one of the tough parts about reviews where i mentioned this earlier right you're, you're put, putting a score on it you probably got a gut feeling you're like like but Elden Ring, you got that good feeling. You're like, this is just, sure. you, you, this is a no doubter. Like this is fine. But then there's ones yeah. like that, like for me, Death Looper. I'm like, ah, yeah, like I'm, I'm in for the mm. headache. Here we go. Have you ever felt you found a way around that? Have you, have you felt that that's gone too far on the platform for um, reviews? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I think I used to. Th I used to think about that stuff a lot more. I, uh, I think when I was when you're coming up and you're sort of like, you know, you, you're figuring out how to be on this platform and who you are as like a creator. I think you definitely really worry that you're going to piss people off. But you know, you, you're more self conscious about that. And but I think over time, like I've learned that the most powerful thing that we have as reviewers is perspective like that's all people tune in for you know what i mean and so if you were to ever sanitize that for fear of like you know pissing off a, the judgment fans or whatever i i just think that 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 doesn't help anyone in the long yeah, term yeah. so yeah obviously that review gets really bombed and whatever but that's okay because everyone knows that i'm always going to say exactly what i think about something sure. some people found that review interesting because it was a different perspective than what they'd seen more broadly um and so that's fine and obviously i get all these clips on twitter from people roasting my gameplay of judgment being like this guy doesn't even use this combo so therefore he doesn't even understand the game like that's a thing that happened repeatedly yeah, by the yeah, way yeah. and it's like that those things happen and they appear in your um your timelines and whatever and as i said i used to care about those a lot more they still get to me a little because you see them and I'm just like oh not this again yeah, you know like the disarming but they just the well thought opinion almost wait but just it's just it's just like such an annoyance where the yeah. where fandoms <laughs> kind of do what they do and like obviously if someone were to come out and say actually i don't really like elden ring very much like that person is just going to go through hell for the next month you know i've seen developers and whatever uh you know getting completely roasted on Twitter for what are fairly innocuous takes about Elden Ring, you know what I mean? And like, they're not great takes, but also at the same time, they don't deserve to be just, I don't know, like it's, it's, yeah, I, I do think that fandoms are, you know, they're a lot to deal with. And I think that they used to affect, affect me a lot more, but as, as I said, being bigger now, having done this for longer, it's much easier just to shrug it off now and be like, cool. Everyone's going to hate this. That's fine. Like, I'm about to review Destiny. I have a very different perspective on Destiny 2 than I think everybody else does at this point. That's okay. Everyone knows me and that I've been playing Destiny enough that, like, they know what I'm about. They know I'm not there just to, like, farm outrage in the Destiny community. Like, here's what I think. And there are enough people that can sort of, like, couch my views. You know what yeah. I mean? And that... um in conversations on other platforms will be like well actually no he's not full of shit because i've seen him do this this and this in the sure. past like it's nice to have people who who have your back you know on yeah. reddit or whatever um and are being like well actually here's some evidence why what you're saying isn't quite true so um yeah i, I don't think there's any clear way through it other than just like time and experience and and just understanding that your perspective is the most powerful and useful thing to you and also the most interesting thing to your audience because that's what they're tuning in for so yeah. absolutely man well said and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. honestly i'm i'm out of topics man i'd love to <laughs> keep you hanging around here we're gonna have to find another yeah. reason to get together but uh, you've been you've been mighty insightful and uh, the experience shows man and I'm, I'm extremely appreciative of you coming through and dropping the wisdom and having this conversation with me on just kind of the the state of modern gaming reviews and and sure. where things could be heading um it's been fascinating so again thank you i really appreciate it no 
thank you very much for having me and yeah man i hope we can do it again sometime yeah, yeah. in the future we'll find a reason yeah we'll figure it out yeah i'm for always, sure, I'm for always sure. churning those ideas so <laughs> ladies and gentlemen i'm sure you already know where to find him but if you don't would you like to tell them where they could find you? I'll have it all linked down yes. below, so don't worry. I'm 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 Skillup, aka Shillup, and I have a YouTube channel, and I review video games and do gaming news hot takes once a week, and uh, I'm on Twitter too much, and uh, that's it, man. So just 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 Google me, you'll find me. Right on. Or links in the description down below, whichever works for you. Again, thank you so much for joining me. Really appreciate this. And with that, nice ladies time. and gentlemen, we'll see you all next time. Stay sexy, stay active. Love you all. Peace. Thank you.